Zero Salem, one more time. I hope you're well. Uh, I'm actually sitting down and recording a proper video, and first time in a while, I bulk recorded like a bunch of stuff that last like huge stacks of death metal, a couple of videos that I did. So I've, I haven't actually sat down and recorded uh, anything in a bit. It's mostly been um, hopping on live streams and uh, drinking too much doers and saying dumb shit. But I'm gonna stick with the some, some low alcohol cheap beer tonight and just kind of kick it with you guys and uh, bust out a re response video to something Marty brought up um, which is uh, meaningful albums from your teenage years which is something that I've talked about kind of extensively but I haven't done a video like that I feel like in over a year and a half um, I did you know my debut video my introduction to the YouTube metal community was uh, the 20 records that got me into death metal, uh, which was like a, it was like a tag going around and I, I felt inspired and lo and behold, here I am three years later still doing this. Um, I've done ones like called, I told, I titled the year of our Lord series, which is where I talk about by every two years, like what I was listening to some other stuff like that. I did one for hardcore, like 25 records got me into hardcore, but I've, I've gathered up there's been a big harvest, nice huge bumper crop of new subscribers since I, I did anything like this, I think. And uh, just to do something fresh, cover some stuff that I haven't before, although I feel like a lot of these I've talked about. But, you know, just to respond, just for something to do, something to talk about, get into it. Uh, Marty's stuff is all thrash. There's a lot of thrash in mind, but there's a lot of like, kind of crossovery stuff, thrash adjacent, um, you know, uh, almost kind of like post like thrash metal crossover New York hardcore kind of shit. Some death metal that I haven't talked about yet. Just a an amalgamation of stuff kind of related that I was into from ages 13 till 19. So kind of get the death metal stuff out of the way. Talk about it first. I listened to this record a lot as a kid, right when it came out. Unleashed Shadows in the Deep came out on Century Media. I had the CD back in the day. It's a pretty decent repress. It was on the poster and stuff. Um, yeah, something about Unleashed. I liked Entombed and Dismember a lot. I grew to like them way more uh, the older I got. Unleashed was the first one that was just like instantly satisfying to me because it was a little bit more simple, stripped down, kind of almost Venom Motorhead speed metal inspired in a way. Like not not in the tone or the depth of the, the growling vocals or anything like that, but just that it was like straightforward charging kind of stuff, which uh, I've always been a fan of stuff like that, you know. But this one's great. Where No Life Dwells, also really good. Um, I haven't explored their discography too far into like stuff they've been doing recently, but I know they're, they're pretty con consistent. The song The Final Silence where they're saying in the chorus, blow up the world, I don't give a damn. I always thought that was entertaining. And it's got a really good cover of Countess Bathory on it, too. Love that record. Another one that I listened to incessantly, like freshman year, was Ten Commandments by Malevolent Creation. So this is a listenable repress. Uh, fucking great. You know, I, Florida death metal was always so precise and always so on point. I can't believe the ratio of, like, really good players there was down there at the time. Brutality, Solstice... You know, of, co of course, all the heavy hitters, of course, Morbid Angel, Nocturnus, you know, all that stuff. All those guys could play really well. Um, but Malevolent Creation, on this, we're still pretty thrashy. You know, it's not all too different. I don't know. Not all too different from, like, a, a Solstice, you know. And they shared members at one point with them as well. Or almost like even Demolition Hammer, you know. The, the, the vocal department, it was a little bit more, like, growly and rough. Um, but it was like just a non-stop like very rain and blood I feel like influenced like death metal and just a, a face ripper I hadn't listened to this in a long fucking time I got this reissue a month and a half ago I want to say and like it, it holds up 
it, it still completely put me on my ass. Just nonstop, fucking very listenable and fun and catchy, but like fucking brutal thrashing death metal stuff. Um, one band that I listened to a lot around that time was also was also kind of death metal, but uh, strangely not, strangely kind of crossover. Um, probably listening to a lot of weird shit like Frank Zappa, I'm thinking, was Dead Horse. Um, they had the occasional growls, they had um, some kind of like crossover kind of punkish parts, um, a little bit of like that southern groove kind of thing, kind of heaviness to them. Oddly kind of psychedelic, like stream of consciousness stuff going on lyrically and musically. The one that I had was Peaceful Death and Pretty Flowers. That is included on this. I would love to have an OG copy of that on CD or tape. It would be just cool to have it, but I'm, I feel like anything like that goes for more money than I want to spend right now. Uh, but they're very cool. The Included on this as well as the uh, Horse Court, an unrelated story that's time consuming, which I never got into at the time. Came out a few years before. That's a little bit more like simple, less wild, like crossover, but also pretty twisted and weird. Um, San Antonio, I think, Texas, Dead Horse, nothing like it. This is Day of the Dead Horse, that's the name of the compilation. Um, one more death metal thing that I was into, this was like halfway through high school, 15, 16. Internal Bleeding, this compiles their demos, both of which I had at the time, um, both of which I think got some kind of pressing on Wild Rags, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Perpetual Degradation and Invocation of Evil, you know, it's almost like they took just a few select things about suffocation and pyrexia and their uh, fellow Long Island, New York era bands, area bands, and just kind of distilled it into this really fucking disgusting, heavy, thudding, almost like beat down hardcore inspired death metal. And I don't know if there's any bleed over. I think like, I think Bulldoze and a few other bands like that. I know Neglect were from Long Island, but it seemed like to almost draw inspiration of that with this like kind of chuggy breakdownish kind of stuff and, and weaving it into death metal, which now is like something that we all know has been a thing for a long time, but you know, with slam and brutal DM and everything, but internal bleeding was the beginning of it. And I used to write to these guys. Uh, I interviewed Chris Prevelis for my zine. They were really, really nice people. We got to see them once at the Lost Horizon, I think when they were touring on the second demo. And then I saw them many, many times at the Worcester Palladium a few years later, 99 through like 2001. They played with a lot of metalcore bands. They played with like Skinless, who was another big one for that kind of style at the time. Um, AF, Agnostic Front. This was the last record they did before they called it a day and reformed in 1998. Uh, I listened to this into the ground. This was put out by Relativity in 91. Uh, Relativity and um, Earache together and separately were putting out a lot of really important stuff at the time. Brutal Truth, demand, Extreme Conditions Demand Extreme Responses, uh, Circle Jerks Gig, which was really, really great. You know, one of my favorite live records. Um, what else? Uh, reissue of COC's Technocracy with bonus tracks from a demo that like were better than the original EP. Uh, there was a bunch of stuff that came out that year. Sick of It All's Just Look Around came out around that time too. Uh, I love this for a while. Um, there's times when I want to throw this on before I even listen to Victim in Pain or any of the records preceding it, which a lot of people think is weird, but there's a certain amount of the population that loves this because this this record kind of was the blueprint for Madball sound and many bands that imitated that. A lot of that had to do with Matt Henderson, the guitarist. Um, Will Shepler, the drummer, was on the previous AF record, Liberty and Justice 4, and would also go on to play in Madball for a couple of records. Uh, Vinny Stigma, of course, Roger Murray. It was, uh, it was AF, but it was AF circa 91. It was, um, it had a strong, like, chuggy, metallic just going outside of uh the thrash metal realm just going outside of what was going on in hardcore um it had a strong sense of rhythm and, and like syncopation to it uh you know a little bit less like blazing fast than their previous records but plenty of fast still very fucking hard very very hard 
um, recorded right after Roger got out of prison, so he had a lot to say about his life behind bars, which is pretty fucking intense. Read his book if you get a chance. Very good read. So I love that record. <coughs> um, and uh, yeah, Madball would start after that with a somewhat similar sound. And it kind of was just like a, it was kind of a symbol of like a new era for New York hardcore sound wise, I, I feel. Um, other hardcore stuff, but also touching on metal, kind of living in between. Uh, very important band to me, and I think a lot of people was COC. Now, I was into Blind when it came out around the same time, and it was one of those weird kind of deals where, you know, not to do the old man like before the internet, because I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing that, but I would just pick up anything I could get my hands on um, where I could find at record stores. So I bought. I bought Misfits Earth AD at the same time, roughly, that I got Danzig 2. And I was aware through word of mouth, because Earth AD, I don't think even had like liner notes saying who played what, but through word of mouth and um, just general knowledge that I picked up from other people that it was the same singer, and I couldn't believe it, because if you've heard Earth AD, it's this cacophonous, noisy, fast punk record, and um, Lucifuge, the second Danzig record, is very different you know bluesy well produced uh involving like very strong vocals that you can hear and whatever coc was a similar scenario where i bought blind that was this cool you know for lack of a better term like post thrash kind of record kind of in the same vein as almost as the black album but way better um or like uh exodus uh whatever that exodus record is with the fear and loathing guy doing the artwork for it um there's a bunch of other shit like that you know it was just the era electric crown by testament like that song it's kind of that kind of that way but done i feel a little bit classier and better um but i had that and i loved it because i loved a lot of stuff like that at the time and then i bought eye for an eye and this is actually the original tape from way back when that i still have managed to hold on to all these years um and uh it was this raw not super tight, but very, like, just overflowing with energy kind of hardcore punk record. One of the first that I heard like that, and, you know, you have to d develop an ear, or at least I did, for listening to stuff that's, like, that, like, fucked up and falling apart and just going for it, you know. Years later, I learned to appreciate Void and Black Flag Damaged, and then past that, bands like Asocial and Finnish Hardcore and stuff. But this was the first record that I heard where I was like, this is like a wall of noise. Like, what the fuck is going on? They're freaking out. And the more you listen to it, the more you're like, okay, here are the, here are the songs. You can hear the riffs, and it's great. Um, this copy came out on Toxic Shock. Uh, this was my friend Pete's. Uh, he passed away some years ago, sadly. And um, a mutual friend of ours who ended up with his record collection was kind enough to give me a few of his records, kind of remember him by... Um, the other one was uh, We Are The League by the Anti-Nowhere League. So, R.I.P. to that guy. Good good dude. This is the same album with different cover art, obviously. This is uh, the no-core version of it. This is a pretty beat-up copy, but I was like, oh, I, want the, I want the version with the other, the weird zombie guy with the earring. Yeah, I love it. Um, huge fan, of course. Got that there. Animosity, great. Technocracy, pretty good. The bonus tracks are actually better than the original EP, but I digress. Let's move on. Uh, another big thrash one for me. Seattle band, Forced Entry. Um, I don't even know how I heard of this band. I don't think they had a video on Headbangers Ball, which was a big way for me to find out about stuff. Probably read a review in Metal Maniacs, I'm thinking. But, um, you know, not much was going on for like smaller thrash bands at that time in 91 or so um you know you still had megadeth and i mean if you want to call metallica thrash at the time you had a few bands from the big four or whatever going on um but like a lot of the more brutal heavy stuff was starting to bubble up from the underground all the roadrunner death metal shit was getting big there were a few bands holding on like wrathchild america and force entry and a band called panic and a few others um, a few heavier bands like Demolition, Hammer, and Epidemic, and whatever. Forced Entry, this was their second full length. And it's very early 90s looking, for one thing. I think this is actually, I mean, it looks like, almost looks like it might be 
I don't think it's Pusshead, but maybe Robert Williams. It's got that sort of vibe to it. I don't know who the artist is, but it's uh, it's fast and it's blistering, but it's got that kind of weird angular choppy choppiness to it. Um, cool, like real gruff vocals. Like there were some comparisons in magazines at the time to the Crumb Suckers, which I could definitely see. It's got the token like goofy thrash songs. There's a song on it called We're Dicks. It's uh, what you'd expect. It's like kind of like a goofy MOD or SOD kind of song. How we spent our summer vacation. It's like, yeah, this song's got swearing on it. Like I remember thinking at the time, but very technically precise and you know pretty uh, forward thinking, like original thrash from that time. And might as well mention some Doom that I was into. Candlemass, Ancient Dreams, huge one for me. First one that I got. Um, I was starting to discover the Doom stuff of the day, um, or even, like, of the 80s at the time, really. Like, I got into St. Vitus in trouble. Um, Disembowelment was huge. Paradise Lost and My Dying Bride, all of that. And it was all the same thing to me, which it was just all Doom. The first Cathedral record was huge. Um, things hadn't really kind of divided up into sub-sub-sub-genres. Just calling it Doom Metal was, like, slicing that down, splitting that hair enough. Um, this is my favorite candle mask still to this day. I bought this on tape in Cincinnati, Ohio when I was visiting my aunt. And um, I knew the name. I knew who they were from around. Um, at first, it took me a little while to, like, adjust to Messiah Marklin's sort of, like, falsetto, like, very metal, operatic, almost kind of vocal delivery. I didn't really care for too much stuff that had that sort of execution other than Bruce Dickinson at the time. Like... I didn't like Dio even at the time. Shame on me. Uh, but anything that like had that real like true metal like singing like I wasn't into. But something about Candlemass I kept going back to. Um, probably because I was really into Dungeons and Dragons at the time. Still am. Uh, but this is a great record. This has got a bunch of extras. It's got a Black Sabbath medley and, and all that. But the the riffs on this are the best to me. I mean I know a lot of people go for Epicus Dumicus Metallicus and Nightfall. You know, all their stuff, most of their stuff is good. But this was always the one, especially, it, it just hooked me with that first riff on Mirror Mirror. Dun, 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 you know, so it made me want to do a little dance. It's good. Uh, Paradise Lost. I fucking love this when I heard it. Uh, I think I heard that Peaceful Comp that was ripping off the cover of Volume 4. Uh, I think it was called Volume 4. Um, the song Gothic really fucking just snared me, first of all with the operatic female vocals, just that sort of like riffs that really could breathe. You know, there wasn't, it wasn't packed with like an assault of like a million riffs. There was a sense of melody, even though there was growly vocals. I just loved it, loved it. Peaceville, you know, one of the Peaceville bands. I got into My Dying Bride a bit. At the time, never got into Anathema until like a few years later. Um, Vision, to jump into like, metal tinged hardcore a little bit this is in the blink of an eye this band would play all the time at uh the lost horizon in syracuse first couple years i was going to shows they were from jersey um pretty legendary band in the jersey scene um like at the city gardens and all that they were just it's like melodic kind of positive sounding hardcore stuff you know not too far removed from turning point or something like that uh, post youth crew or whatever if you want to call it that but there's some really good like almost kind of shreddy like riffs and, and little little pull-offs here and there that I, I like a lot their second record um just short of living I think got they didn't go metal but I think it had some stronger metal trappings on it but I haven't heard it in, in forever but great band great choruses on this great sing-alongs um this is going to be jumping around a little bit, fast forwarding to the, I probably was like 18 or 19 when I picked this up. Discharge Live, The Nightmare Continues. This is a live record. You can see there, that's uh, 498 used. It was a local record store, Oliver's, that we all used to kind of congregate at and hang out at in Syracuse. It was on SU campus, Marshall Street. And they often had like nothing there good. Um, not to disparage the place, it's not around anymore, but they had a kind of a poor business model, I feel like, uh, from what I remember anyway. And it seemed like anything cool they got they got in, they gave it to their employees because they couldn't afford to pay them. That's what I heard. Um, 
anyway, once in a while you go to a used record store and somebody sells their collection. And that's what happened in this case, where it was like a gold mine, where a few, me and a few of my friends, my friend Shayna, my friend Sean, a couple other people, uh, this older punk dude had sold, I don't know, 20 LPs maybe, tops. And we were just like, holy shit. And this was one of them. I got the debut JFA LP, GBH, Broken Bones, Jerry's Kids, Is This, Is this My World? And all those were like under five bucks each. Crazy. Um, but Discharge was this legendary obscure at the time believe it or not band to me i knew that they were massively influential on tons of metal bands you'd seen you know guys in metallica wearing their shirts um i'd known enough about like newer stuff at the time to get that they were a big influence on like disrupt big influence on disgust especially you know all that the i was aware of the disc bands like it wasn't called d beat at the time they were called discord but I was reading Maximum Rock and Roll, and I knew that Discharge was, like, the first, but I still hadn't fucking heard them because I couldn't find anything, like, in my town. And uh, it wasn't until I was around 18 or so that I picked up this live record. And it's great. It sounds good. It's got all the hits on it. Never Again, Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing, Nightmare Continues, State Violence, State Control, Protest and Survive, Drunk with Power, Two Monstrous Nuclear Stockpiles, Decontrol. Um, very fucking great live recording and then from there on like when I moved to Boston I, I found their records and you know got it and it actually also weirdly enough I was familiar with them because Anthrax covered them um they, they covered Protest and Survive I uh I I like that song but listening to the songs they're so stripped down and they weren't catchy in the way that like GBH or The Exploited were they're so like desperate sounding and kind of sparse that like at first, I was like, this is Discharge? Where's the hooks, you know? And, and then I just realized, like, oh, yeah, because it, it's supposed to sound like the fucking world ending, so... It's, uh, it's powerful that way. It's bleak, you know? It took me a little while to get it. Um, probably should have pulled a different Slayer record, but fuck it. Um, I was thinking about this... I pulled this stack, like, the other night and didn't, didn't get around to filming it. Uh, I was thinking, like, Show No Mercy would be more appropriate because I listened to it the most in high school. But fuck it. Um... Seasons in the Abyss. This came out in 90. Uh, I was 12. I didn't properly get into it. Maybe a year or so later. Didn't pick it up, but I listened to it all the way throughout high school. Over and over again. Um, you know, it's one of the one of the Slayer records that I feel, I don't think it gets low rated necessarily, but everybody talks about Show No Mercy to talk about the new wave of British heavy metal influence. People talk, of course, about Rain and Blood just for what what a groundbreakingly fast and like intense record it was, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, this was great for me because the songs were accessible. Um, they were on Headbangers Ball um, and The Box, and this was everywhere, you know. Um, and it's got some really good songs that I still like. There's some that don't hold up quite as much. War Ensemble is still unfuckwithable as far, as far as I'm concerned. Hollowed Point, you know, it still had that raging... Um, thrashing evil Slayer stuff going on. Born of Fire, great. Uh, Seasons in the Abyss, the title track. I'd seen that so that video so many fucking times on Headbangers Ball and heard it so many times, like over PAs at shows. I don't know. I don't know if I'm as into that, but it's a it's a great record. It's a great record. It's got a lot of texture to it, a lot of peaks and valleys, and I think that's good. So uh, next up, here's one that I was really into. Uh, Life of Agony. River Runs Red. I loved this when it came out, and then I went through a period of being way too punk, um, getting into crust and stuff like that, and kind of, like, just despising all the really metal and, and kind of more metallic hardcore stuff that I was into and disavowing it. And then somewhere around becoming an adult, I was just like, oh, yeah, that... That record had great songs, and I listened to it into the ground after revisiting it, and it hasn't really left my listening diet since then. And that was probably like my mid-20s, so it's been a long time that I've loved this record. Um, but when it came out, uh, yeah, I think it was freshman year, maybe sophomore year. At first I didn't like it because it had these crooning, you know, somewhere between like maybe Danzig and like a grunge dude kind of vocals. Um, you know, the it was not all fast. It was very 
kind of chunky and groovy and with those kind of vocals it didn't really make sense for me and i think that's probably why this record's detractors don't like it you know but something about it um the catchiness of it uh the riffs the quality of the riffs themselves are so heavy they have a great fucking tone that's like very indebted to like sod i feel like it's very brooklyn i love uh i love this record life of agony and this was the era of all that stuff coming out with like these bands would play Lamore, the big metal cu club in Brooklyn, and they would play with, like, Creator, and they'd play with Sepultura, and it was, like, kind of a new era of crossover, sort of, um, and a lot of that stuff landed right in my lap, because all these bands came out on Roadrunner, and I loved them, you know, it wasn't much longer after that than Roadrunner started signing, like, new metal bands, and at that point, I wasn't really interested in listening to anything like that, but Biohazard, Life of Agony, and Typo Negative all super important to my formative years. Uh, this is the self-titled. I was uh, cool enough to be into Biohazard before Urban Discipline came out. Somebody dubbed this for me. I remember having a tape that had, it was like a 100 minute tape or 120 minute tape even, that had Blood, Sweat, No Tears by Sick of It All. It had this debut self-titled Biohazard record. What else did it have on it? Um, Technocracy by COC and I think I just crammed a few carnivore songs on the end. What a great tape. <laughs> Listen to it a lot. But this is like the culmination of like what New York hardcore was evolving into at the time. You know, you had even visually, like you had two long haired guys, two short haired guys. Um, yeah, there was a lot of soloing, there was like accomplished musicianship, but the sort of like almost kind of staccato vocal attack and the kind of chunkiness of the riffs and the way it was went from like these kind of like very pummeling circle pit inducing fast parts to these sort of groovy parts you know there was a lot of that sort of just hip-hop kind of attitude woven in that way had been paid for biohazard for bands like breakdown uh killing time outburst all kinds of stuff like that and it was kind of like those those new york bands that were on like the where the wild things are comp and shit like that kind of this is like almost like the metalized version of, of that stuff in my opinion um very fucking great record though uh i love this I, mostly the one that i reach for now i don't have a copy of urban discipline i might um pull it out if i had it but songs like blue blood with the great fucking chorus um you know about working class pride which you gotta have with you know this kind of stuff you gotta have one of those songs survival of the fittest there's even like a piano intro on one of the songs you know they're you know i mean they got huge they got huge for a reason they had the chops uh coming up next typo negative oh i picked this up not that long ago talked about it not that long ago this is a huge massive fucking tome of a repress came out record store day looks like uh it's on green vinyl i'm not gonna pull it out talked about it already but also, I was into Carnivore, and I was into the debut Typo Negative record uh, when it came out, too, because uh, via Metal Maniacs, I read, up, read about all that stuff. It just so happened that I bought the Carnivore tape because of the album art, <laughs> and uh, I read the lyrics, and I was like, well, this looks fucked up, and it's talking about nuclear war and, and stuff. Like, why don't I buy this? At the same time, I got Slow, Deep, and Hard, and I was like, oh, it's the same dude. Okay. Um, but the Slow, Deep, and Hard record is, of course, like kind of a transitionary record between the Carnivore stuff and, and this. And this was my gateway drug, really, for getting into, I, I think it was for a lot of people, getting into goth. Um, you know, it had those kind of, that kind of vampiric, tongue-in-cheek, but vampiric, like, kind of vocal approach that Peter Steele had, where he rolls his R's and all that kind of stuff, and the harpsichord. But it, there's stuff on here, uh, like, uh, Sets Me on Fire, sounds like a cult song. You know, you can hear the 80s synth pops kind of thing going on with it. There's still a little bit of metal and hardcore Beatles influence. Um, they were just, they were doing something really different at the time. And I, I love this. I had a dub of it. I never even owned a copy when I was a kid. But I remember the era of like 10th grade. I just grown my hair long. I was wearing a black trench coat with combat boots. You know, I had like a little shitty goatee. I was all about this stuff. I still love it. Um... Then we got Nuclear Assault. Talked plenty about Nuclear Assault. Um, Marty, I think, talked about Game Over. This is a dub I had. I had a dub of this on the other side of 
I want to say the Vision record. I had these two on a tape. Um, I celebrate Nuclear Assault's catalog up until this record extensively. Um, I remember Handle with Care is really good. Game Over is really good. There was one after this that was decent that's slipping my mind right now. I listen to that one a lot too because that was the newest one that came out. I think as far as like the, the whole Nuclear Assault canon goes, I mean, Game Over is actually my favorite. Um, this one though, I think is like the most, again, like instantly gratifying, like distilled down to the, the purest, like forceful kind of energy recording that they have. Um, it's, it's also probably the best sounding production wise recording they have out of all their early records. Critical Mass, you know, another forest dies all that stuff uh the bass tone on this especially sounds really good it might be the fastest and most extreme they get i think uh you know that's up to debate but also like on in effect with af and sick of it all at the time can't go wrong with a thrash collage there I've also noticed like game over is like the record that a lot of like punks and crusties like a lot and that handle with care seems to be the one that like a lot of hardcore kids like a lot i don't know if that's just a regional thing in my area where I've grown up or, or what um also multiple copies again flexing this I got into at the very end of my teens I probably was about to turn 20 the accused the turn of Martha Splatterhead um yeah very very important band to me here especially because when I got into them at the time there wasn't a lot of metal I was listening to but there was something, especially about this record, again, going back to the COC thing, way tighter than Eye for an Eye, this record, but it's still got like this, this rumbly bass, and it just sounds like they're, they're literally jumping around the studio while they're playing it. Uh, I played it for a friend of mine back when I first got the tape, and he said to me, this sounds like the year and seven inches stuff from the Discord compilation uh, that's like uh, Minor Threat, SOA, Teen Idols, and the DC Youth Brigade, which is like fast wiry you know hardcore punk hyper fast stuff it's like it sounds like a metal version of that i'm like yeah it kind of does in a weird way um it's just fucking great i i love the accused i like everything they they did up to a certain point pretty much their entire first run up to the splatter rock record is is good real good their first three are perfect in my opinion um i also got this is not an original pressing that was on their subcore label but a reissue of it repressing of the original artwork i think there's three different covers for this altogether. uh yeah love the accused uh, like i mentioned talking about denial fiends vocals are like this vomiting shrieking kind of thing uh which is just there's nobody like them and years later when i would get into crust you know i got into stuff like filth and dystopia and ass rash and all this kind of like drunk metallic punk stuff that was on like uh a lot of stuff on profane existence records and, and shit like that i was like man a lot of these guys sound like blaine and i don't know if it was deliberate or not but like jake filth from filth sounds a lot like blaine to me like this very snotty yet possessed kind of drunk sounding thing i don't know one of my favorite vocalists of all time for sure um i was really into prong you know prong life of agony biohazard typo negative this is all stuff that was huge in the 90s especially because i grew up I grew up in New York, New York State, nowhere near the city, but I think all this kind of filtered up there. Um, all those bands played not too far from where I lived. Uh, this is probably, I mean, my favorite prong is probably Primitive Origins, but I don't, I never heard that until maybe 10 years ago. This, was this the first one I got? I don't remember. Um, Beg to Differ, Prove You Wrong, I think was the last one that I cared about. That one's cool. Um, and to me at the time, they just sounded like, a thrash metal band with like weird parts that weren't like blazing fast all the time. They had like a certain mechanical kind of quality to them. Um, it's only years later that like I read interviews with them. I'm like, Oh, the drummer from prong was in the swans and Oh, they were like really influenced by like post-punk and killing joke. I can totally hear that now, but they were also playing a certain type of really weird street level metal, you know, that got more kind of groove metal as time went on and I lost interest, but you know, all this other stuff, like Tommy Victor was the sound guy at CBGB's, and you'd see old flyers with them playing with, like, Sheer Terror, and Tommy Victor produced a Sheer Terror record, and they have a connections to a lot other stuff, a lot of other stuff that I've been in, into over the years, and this record's, out of the ones that I was originally into at the time, this is probably my favorite, um, 
just cool. There's something with the vocals. They sound really cold. You know, it's got like the, the feel of like a shitty cement practice room somewhere in the Bowery in the middle of winter. You know, it's just good. Um, I was really into suicidal really early on. I was into Lights, Camera, Revolution quite a bit. That was my intro to them. Um, you know, wore that tape out. You know, certain songs from it hold up to me for me still. Namely, uh, you know, You Can't Bring Me Down, Disco's Out, Murder's In. But then they, you know, they started going on off in this funk tangent later on that didn't hold up for me so much. Um, and I kind of discovered their back catalog, like, years, as the years went by, going, like, from that newest one way back. It was, like, around that time that uh, I think MTV, again, Headbangers Ball, played the original video for Institutionalized, and I was like, holy shit, they were like a straight up fucking hardcore band. And I think like, I was like, I thought I heard that somewhere, but I had no idea. Again, you know, hearing the latest record from a band and then discovering their early stuff and being like, wow, you know, this is totally different. And I mean, a lot of people rate this as like one of the best hardcore records ever. It's certainly up there. I mean, everything about it, like, why are they hanging from their feet from like, you know, a jungle gym or a playground or whatever that is. You know, like all these, they had t-shirt parties where they would like marker up and like, you know, it looked like, it looked like some LA gang shit, but it was all satanic. You know, it was all their own brand, their own, their own thing. And they had their own people that ran around with them and caused trouble and everything. And they kind of, you know, had a place in infamy in music. And musically, this record is one of the best hardcore records. I agree, you know, with the, the people, I agree with the flock on that, just because it's got um a guitar tone that's like not too distorted it's really like warm um you can hear everything that's going on really well and these awesome shredding solos all over everything i mean i think that like they were headed towards the crossover thing anyway because of just because of the solo work there's nothing too complicated about the riffs themselves it's just very very fast you know hardcore that's like stop on a dime and really precise like probably almost giving the early bad brain stuff like a run for their money or whatever but fuck this record's so good and testament the legacy great thrash metal record you know bay area thrash debut you know most of the debuts from the bay area bands are all really good um you know it had like a certain i don't know it, there's a song on it called the haunting and i feel like a lot of the production and like lyrics and, and solos and everything almost give it sort of a haunting quality overall. It's got that sort of reverb drenched sort of thing produced by Alex Perry Ellis. So it has that sort of, you know, that mega force sound that's like, it's a bit on the trebly side and there's a lot of reverb and stuff, but it's charming in its own way. It's very like kind of wiry, you know, it's got that, got that sound of early thrash and uh, you know, it's thrash metal done really well. And then, finally, Neurosis, Pain of Mind. I don't think this is a legit pressing. I'm not sure. Uh, it says Made in Russia, so probably not. Uh, but I had a different version of this. I had the CD that had different artwork. It had that guy, um, Bud, R. Bud Dwyer, I think his name was, who um, took his own life on a public broadcast sometime in the 80s on, on public tv i bought that and i bought souls at zero at the same time another two another example of going to a record store and buying two eras of a band and being like what the fuck um especially because neurosis after this turned into something totally different um but this is i mean i don't know how else to put this other than this this is a, a psychedelic hardcore record it's it's trippy it's weird you know, you could tell these guys were having some fun with some, some drugs. Um, very, very dark, but still fast and raging. There's, you know, vocal trade-offs between two, two instrumentalists that both sing. Um, massively influential on bands like Devoid of Faith and uh, His Hero is Gone. I feel like this early stuff, like a lot of the murkier, gloomier crust stuff kind of all comes from this and, and their buddies in Christ on Parade, so... Yeah, loved it. This I got, again, like, probably 18, 19 years old. Um, very important 
or what I would get into not too long after that. That's it. Wow, 40 minutes. Well, I'm going to edit the shit out of it. I did a lot of rambling. Um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good work week.